Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, uh, AFA's Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And I'd like to welcome you to our Aerospace Nation speaker series, our next installment. Um, we're really pleased to have with us today, uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Lewis. Um, Mark is DOD's Director of Defense Research and Engineering for Modernization. Uh, and in that role, he oversees the development of advanced technologies that promise to transform how America's warfighters operate. This includes quite a list, 5G technologies, artificial intelligence, directed energy, hypersonics, quantum science, and cyber and space modernization. Now, Dr. Lewis has led research teams that have supported the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. And he also served as the Air Force's chief scientist from 2004 to 2008, where I got to know him as we both overlapped on the air staff together. So welcome, Mark, uh, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Dave, thanks a lot. You bet. Given your deep knowledge of technologies that will reshape how our Air Force and the nation will fight in the future, how about starting with uh, sharing your thoughts on a few of those technologies that you believe might have the greatest impact. Sure, so, so let me give you a little bit of a background if I could on, on what our office is doing. And essentially, sure. as you pointed out, we're, we are overseeing a series of technologies, or as I like to say, modernization priorities that are derived directly from the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And, and I, I'm, I'm sure all of your listeners have, have read through that strategy. Um, some of us have argued it's, it's the first real strategy we've had in quite some time with a very strong focus on Russia and especially China peer competition. The, the strategy also highlights um, a series of technologies that, that, that are key to maintaining dominance, to exerting dominance um, in the years to come. Um, you mentioned some of them. Um, the, the long list includes autonomy, it's cyber, it's microelectronics, biotechnology, directed energy, quantum science, as you mentioned, fully networked command control communications, um, artificial intelligence, 5G communications, space, and, and of course, hypersonics. Like, we've got to get hypersonics on that list. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, you know, each one of those areas is important in its own right. And I'd argue that each has its own set of challenges and opportunities. And they're really quite different. So, for example, um, we're very enthusiastic about quantum technologies. But we want to make sure that those quantum technologies are focused on the right, on the right, tech, on the right applications, the right things. It's very easy to get lost in some of the science fiction uh, promises of quantum without focusing on, on, on the real promise. And I, I, maybe we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, microelectronics, we think that's another really important one. And I'll, I'll emphasize that because it underlies almost everything that we do. Making sure that we have a secure, robust microelectronic industrial base that gives us, the Department of Defense, access to state-of-the-art capabilities, absolutely important. Obviously, I think hypersonics is key. Um, I will tell you, when I first signed on, my, my boss, Mike Griffin, and I sat down and I said, I'm looking forward to working on his number one priority, hypersonics. Mike had uh, given a couple of talks about that. And the first thing he said to me was, oh, it's no longer my number one priority. And, and that's in part because we think we've done a lot on, on, in that area. Um, our assistant director covering hypersonics, Mike White, has made tremendous progress. It's a real good news story in terms of the interactions between the services and the agencies. Um, directed energy, I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit more about direct energy. That's another one where we're putting a lot of emphasis. We think it will bring a lot of capabilities. And like hypersonics, it's a technology area that has had lots of promise over the years. And now we are finally seeing that promise come to fruition. Well, very good, Mark. That's a, that's a good way. It's a nice uh, oversight. Uh, really uh, appreciate that. Now, let's uh, dig a little deeper into these technologies uh, before we open this session uh, to questions from the media and our other listeners. Um, you know, you, you talked about hypersonics uh, and its uh, relative prioritization. Uh, China and Russia are now uh, both beginning to field hypersonic weapons, in, including hypersonic glide vehicles. Uh, the Defense Department studied the potential to develop space-based defenses against ballistic uh, missile boosters and reentry vehicles for years. But these technologies have never transitioned to acquisition programs. Is it possible to field space-based defenses against hypersonic weapons? And if so, how long is it going to take before we can begin to field them? 
Sure. So I would actually answer your question in the following way. I think that any robust hypersonic defensive system must include a component in space. And, and I'll say that for the following reason. So the first step in defending against a hypersonic weapon is detecting it. I don't know of any better way to do that than from space. And to that extent, we think that in, in our office, we think that proliferated LEO constellations are the way to do that. I'll explain one of the challenges of hypersonics. People often think of hypersonics just in terms of speed. It's more than speed. It's speed, it's maneuverability, but it's also the trajectories, the altitudes at which these things operate. A hypersonic system can operate at, 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 at an altitude such that it's difficult to see both from space or from the ground. It's low enough altitude that you don't get much of an over horizon view, but, but it, it's also low enough that viewing from space, it's difficult to detect against ground clutter. So we think that a more robust space architecture is required. Indeed, we have an entire agency within the office called the Space, Defend, uh, the, the space Development Agency, the SDA. And one of the reasons it was stood up was to, to put into place a, uh, a detection system just particularly, particularly for uh, hypersonic systems. Um, when is that gonna happen? Um, we are moving very, very quickly on this. So we're looking at, at deployment of initial satellites, initial, initial tranche of, of demonstration satellites uh, in the next couple of years, because we think this is absolutely critical. Um, very good. Are you considering uh, the integration slash incorporation of uh, uh, commercially, commercial systems that might help in um, uh, identification and detection? So absolutely. So commercial, commercial can play, but we always have to remember that you know, there, there's a big push for commercial. And, and we have a lot of folks say, why don't we just switch to commercial solutions? Not just in space, but across the board. But you know, the DOD will always have unique needs and unique capabilities. And when there are instances when commercial can help us, or in some cases do some, something better than we can do, fine. But we also have to maintain control and main, maintain a resilient defense infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, I'm, I'm, uh, I think most of us um, who are interested in optimizing our defense capabilities have watched this evolution of the incorporation of commercial space uh, from lots of resistance from inside the Department of Defense, um, right. you know, just 10 years ago uh, to a much more uh, embracement. And uh, the, the balance that you speak about, um, I, I, I think, is, is, is very appropriate. Yeah. Um, now, broadening this topic a bit, we know uh, Department of Defense's missile defenses fall short of what's needed to defeat large missile salvos against our theater air bases. What's the prospect for developing over the next de decade a robust layered space, land, and sea-based defense for countering all missile threats? Uh, so and, honestly, that, yeah, that's a, that's a really tall order. <laughs> that's yeah. a really difficult thing to do. You bet. And, and frankly- well, That's why I ask you the question. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're the smartest guy out there to, to answer it. Yeah, I wish I had a good answer to that one. I don't see an easy answer to that. And, but I'm actually okay with that, because I, I do think that our current plans are well constructed to address the threat primarily from rogue nations, from nations that are frankly willing to risk the lives of their citizens um, in, in ways that maybe our, our, our peer competitors are not. So um, I, I, I think for now that might be a bridge too far, but at the same time, we're, we're, we do have very successful, very capable systems that can defend against the smaller salvos. Um, speaking of the Chinese and the Russians, their air and missile defense systems are increasingly capable against our legacy weapons, including uh, supersonic and subsonic cruise missiles. Looking across your modernization priority areas, can you describe some of the improvements that might be made to increase the survivability of U.S. precision strikes against these threats? Sure, I think there are a number of the things that we're doing are, are, are aimed at addressing just that threat. Um, I will tell you that when we talk about our modernization priorities, we like to say all China all the time, uh, because that's our, that's our primary threat. And I think there are several, several elements to it. First is obviously on the kinetic side, the weapon side. That's why we're so interested in hypersonics, not just to counter what the Chinese and the Russians are doing, but also to provide our own capabilities, our, our, our own offensive systems. Um, Fully network command control communications. That is absolutely essential. And, and I want to tip my hat to the, to the Mitchell Institute because I think you're the guys who started talking about the combat cloud and the importance of integrating our, our, our sensors um, and our communication systems. Um, that is absolutely essential. 
Um, and, and the good news is I, I think the building is, has caught on to that. Um, the Air Force especially has shown some tremendous leadership in, um, in, 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 in addressing the future needs for, for network command control communication. The other service, the Army and, and the Navy as well. It, it, it really is right now, I think, a, a good news story. Um, 5G communication, that's one of our modernization priorities. And why are we interested in 5G communication? Because we all think, also think it's essential that we need to be able to communicate anywhere any place on earth, even in um, less than, uh, even in hostile environments. And so we think that's, that's key as well, making sure that 5G communication is available to, the, to, to uh, our military systems. No, that, very good and appreciate that, uh, Mark. It, we've been, something been talking about for uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years on this whole notion of uh, connectivity uh, and really the, the, the evolution of the next big thing. And whatever right. it is will be based on the ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information. And whether yeah. you call it the combat cloud or join all domain uh, you know, connectivity, uh, command and control, advanced battle management, um, uh, NIFCA, it, it's all the same thing. Uh, and it, it is good to see the department finally wrapping its arms around this concept because that's what's gonna take us uh, to success in the next time we have to fight, if we can get those systems developed. Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, okay. coming to the building, I, I, as being involved in some of the discussions on, on network command control, um, it was amazing to find out that some of our legacy systems not only don't communicate, we, we know they don't communicate well, but finding out that in some cases, they were specifically designed not to communicate well. Right. And you kind of scratch your head on that and say, why, why would we ever do that? Well, so, it's, so, again, I mean, we could spend a whole hour or two hours uh, a day talking about um, the, the fact that, you know, many of the weapon systems that we currently have were developed in a different time, a different period in the last century, um, where everything focused on each individual weapon system having its own independent operating construct. And now we have to expand that uh, and, and, and share information. But we didn't have the connectivity uh, that, uh, that we have today. I mean, a great example of that's what we're doing today. You look at the entire world, they, they are now interconnected. Uh, okay, let's move on to something that you uh, uh, are renowned for and that's uh, hypersonics. Um, the hypersonic air breathing weapon concept, or HAWK, um, is now in development. For our, for our listeners out there, this is a joint DARPA Air Force program um, that seeks to develop uh, and demonstrate critical technologies uh, to enable an effective and affordable uh, air launch hypersonic cruise missile. Um, do you think propulsion technologies being developed for HAWK uh, could actually have broader applications, such as powering a future combat aircraft that might operate at near space altitudes? So absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're focused right now, our hypersonics portfolio is focused first on what I call the low hanging fruit, which will be the weapon systems. And I will tell you that the weapon systems that I'm, I'm most interested in are things that are air launched. Air launch cruise missiles, be they rocket boost glide or the, be they, they air breathing. Um, but it's very clear that those, especially the air breathing systems, the scramjet powered systems, can evolve into larger vehicles, possibly unmanned, possibly even manned, um, you know, for many years, we've had the dream of the SR-72, the, the Mach 6 plus version of an SR-71. Um, we're not there yet, but I think with some of the technologies that we've been demonstrating, that we've been putting in place, yes, we see a path to get there. But again, before we, get, be, before we even get there, just having the air breathing cruise missiles, rocket, based, rocket boost glide systems, I think will abs absolutely be critical to our, 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 our future capabilities. Well, to go a little bit deeper in this area, when do you think propulsion technologies might be mature enough to develop combat space planes that can achieve orbit with a single stage to get there? So, so okay, I'm going to be a little bit skeptical. You know, part of my job is to be the technology skeptic. So single stage to orbit is a really difficult thing to do, which we've learned every time we've tried to do it, right? Um, you may recall in the late 1980s, we had the National Aerospace Plane. I graduate at the time. It's how I got started in hypersonics. And the National Aerospace Plane started as a, as a DARPA program to build a 35,000 pound aircraft that would take off from any runway and fly up to space as, as a space plane. 
When the National Airspace Plane program was finally discontinued, the size of the vehicle had grown to almost 500,000 pounds. Yeah, a little it different, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and you know, for, for, for our, our friends who are listening who understand uh, aircraft design, a, 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 good, a, a good rule of thumb is weight equals cost. So, so a 500,000 pound aircraft is, is quite a proposition. Having said that, it isn't clear to me that we have to do single stage to orbit. All right, there are two stage to orbit solutions that are perfectly viable and I think would give us some interesting space plane capabilities in the future. Okay, excellent. Hey, uh, hypersonic technology, uh, as, as you sort of alluded to just now in the department, um, although uh, NASP was not uh, just a DOD project, but inside DOD, hypersonics had some rough edges over the years. Um, at times, uh, value was lost because some decisions about the priority of hypersonics were not as clear uh, as they might have been. I mean, you've tracked this technology for a long time. Uh, so as you look at the history of hypersonics and DOD, um, what are some of the lessons learned that might transfer to other technology development areas? Sure, well, I think there are a lot of lessons learned. I will tell you that hypersonics is an area that has been brought with, with considerable frustration. And frustration because I think the field has suffered from, from a, couple of, a couple of key issues. One is we've been extremely inconsistent in the funding. If you track funding in hypersonic technologies, it follows this 15 year cycle. It's a boom and bust cycle. And we, we make some progress, we make some advances, and then we toss in the towel and we wait a couple of years. We, in some cases, just start all over again. So one important lesson is consistency. And, and if you look at some of our, our competitors, I mean, the Russians, I gotta tell you, one of the hallmarks of their programs is consistency. They'll have failure after failure after failure, and they'll just keep at it until they get it to work. Um, the other thing that we, we, we've seen in hypersonics is, and, and this is a fault of the research community itself, we've had a tendency to oversell hypersonics. All right, we'll, we'll have one small achievement, and the next thing you know, people are actually envisioning single stage to orbit vehicles. You know, you, you talked about the NASP program. So it was a really gutsy program, but it was envisioning a vehicle that could fly at 25 times the speed of sound in an era before we'd ever flown five times the speed of sound with an air breathing engine, all right? So, so reality and not overselling a program is absolutely important. I'll tell you what I find most frustrating in the history of, of, of hypersonics though. Um, there have been times when we haven't accepted enough risk, but there are times when we've made what I would call dumb risk decisions. In other words, we've done programs where the riskiest elements of the program weren't about the hypersonic technologies we were trying to test, right? So that was bad. And then we also have uh, given up, not only have we given up too easily, we've had programs that failed for reasons completely unrelated to the hypersonics, and we gave up on them. We also failed to capitalize on our successes. You know, my, probably my, my biggest uh, 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 career frustration is right after we flew the X-51 vehicle, instead of building on that, building more, flying more, we, we basically gave up on it. And we kind of set ourselves back almost a decade and wound up starting over, almost starting over from scratch to restart air breathing technology. So, so a good lesson right. learned is don't do that. <laughs> yeah, no, and isn't that, however, isn't that a function of our, our programming and budgeting system? Because the money hadn't been in uh, in advance and so therefore it, it, nothing happened? I, I think I think there's a very strong element of that. Um, honestly, I think there's another element. You know, our, our 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 dear friend Dick Hallion likes to say all of history is personal, and I think a lot of it is driven by personalities. We've got absolutely. Who, you, know, you got someone who understands the value of the technology, who supports the technology. Um, when I was chief scientist, we had you know General Mosley and Secretary Wynne, and they got it. Right. And and then folks come in afterwards and they have less of a appreciation, less of a perspective, and we won't find ourselves in a, in right. a, in a downturn. Okay, well, um, excellent. Thanks for that, uh, uh, that uh, answer. Um, now, you let's switch gears a bit. You've focused also on the development of directed energy technologies, such as high-power solid-state lasers and high-powered microwave systems. Um, now, when most people think directed energy, they tend to think about its use in a defensive perspective. Um, what are your thoughts on using directed energy for offensive operations? So actually, let me step back and give you a, a basic our basic philosophy in directed energy that will inform my answer, which is you don't want to use directed energy to do something that we already do with kinetic solutions, unless it can do it better, right? And, and that's a, a lot of that. You've got people who want to replace the gun with the laser. 
And that doesn't always, that in, in some cases it gives you lesser capability. So, so our, our fundamental philosophy is use directed energy for things that you can't already do. That's why it, it's a natural for some of the defensive missions. Instead of launching a, a yeah, million yeah. dollar missile against a thousand dollar UAV, you want to hit it with a directed energy system with, with a large magazine. Um, offensive systems, it's a little bit more challenging because it's, there, are, there are some defenses that people can put up against our offensive direct energy systems. Um, we're also not quite at the power levels yet. Yeah. Now, having said that, we are making tremendous advances. I, I, I likened it to hypersonics, where it's a field that's had so much promise for so many years, never quite came to fruition. And now we're seeing directed energy uh, power levels in large measure because of the investments we've made in solid state systems that are at the point where they can have significant offensive capabilities. I, I will say this, we're, we're not at the level of putting the laser on the jet fighter yet. No, I <laughs> that's, understand. That's, that's a long way off. I understand, but you know, the, uh, I think you and I both agree that uh, once we get to deployable uh, directed energy systems, those will be game changing in the true sense of the word, because today we, we tend to fight at the speed of sound uh, and you transition that to being able to fight at the speed of light. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, that's going to make a big difference. As, as the hypersonics guy, I like to point out the speed of light is Mach 1 million. So yeah, that's so, really nice. Yeah, it's, Excellent. A good, good, it's a good round number. And, and you're yeah, exactly yeah. right. I'm, I'll be most interested once we have these systems. I think the con ops, how we use them will be, will be really interesting. And again, we have to be open to the idea that we're not going to use them the same way that we use kinetic systems, that they bring new, no, new capabilities. As you said, game, game, game changing is overused, is an overused term. But in this case, it truly could be game changing. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I mean. And you're exactly yeah. right. Um, we need people not to just apply the way that we did things in the past. This is true, and it still is, um, with low observability and stealth. Uh, people yeah. are still trying to think about doing that as we have with non-stealthy systems. But again, another different subject. Now, yeah. for warfighters that are facing uh, shrinking technolo uh, technology uh, advantages relative to China and Russia, um, all of this tech talk is great. Uh, but to the folks who are out there at the tip of the spear, it's always about capability in hand. So are you looking at ways to accelerate the transition to some of these technologies we're talking about, to capabilities that are usable by our warfighters? Every single day. That's our number one priority, getting these, getting these technologies in the hands of our warfighters as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I'll give you an example. So, so um, you, know, you mentioned hypersonics, and as you know, I have a passing interest in hypersonics. Um, one of the big things we've initiated is what we're calling the hypersonic acceleration plan. So as, as of when I first came play in, on, is that an intentional play on words? No, it is not. It is not. Uh, I didn't coin the phrase. Uh, my, my, my hypersonics assistant director, Mike White did. But one of the things that we saw was we, we had a number of programs in the department that were, you know, very solid technology programs. But at the end of that pro of those programs, we would have prototypes and we'd have, you know, weapons in the single digit counts. You know, if you've got a, You've got, right. a, you've got a program that delivers eight missiles and then stops. Well, wh which are the thousand targets in our target set are we going to use those eight missiles against? And so we've initiated this acceleration plan because we, we want to deliver hypersonics at scale. That means hundreds of weapons in a short period of time in the hands of the warfighter. Now, there are a couple of keys to doing that. One is we need to make sure that we're getting the cost of those weapons down to a reasonable amount. That's, that's probably our biggest obstacle the cost. Although I like to point out, it's not just the cost of the weapon, it's the cost of the system, the cost of the effect. But still, keeping those costs manageable is important. But two, we need to be thinking in terms of how do we deliver real capability in real numbers. And my, my boss, Mike Griffin, likes to point out that when we were building nuclear weapons, we had this incredible nuclear enterprise that was able to build tens of thousands of nuclear triggers, for example. That's the mindset that we're applying to some of our, our current technologies. So in hypersonics, we're asking, what does it take to deliver real capability? That's not just the, the, the prize, but it's the entire industrial base that feeds that capability. And, and indeed, to that end, um, I'm co-chairing what we're calling a war room with uh, my counterpart under Ellen Lord's organization, uh, Kevin Fahey, where we're looking at the hypersonic uh, industrial base to figure out what are the key parts of our supply chain that we need to energize to enable the delivery of numbers in scale in a reasonable amount of time. Now, 
uh, there's been talk about using the old Century Series aircraft uh, development of the 1950s as a model for the future. Uh, some have been pushing for a digital Century Series approach to developing new combat aircraft. Now, on the one hand, the original Century Series represented a rapid innovation cycle and in pushing the technological edge. But on the other hand, these aircraft had many failures, mishaps, and the technology challenges then were very different than they are today. Um, can you speak a bit to this relationship between risk, failure, and pushing the technological edge? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think we all acknowledge that modern systems take a long time to develop, 10, 15, 20 years for a new weapon system, and, and we'd all like to speed that process up. Um, it's not just true on the military side. Uh, NASA went through in the 1990s, they went through a push to try to speed up the development of their aerospace systems as well. Uh, it was collectively known as faster, cheaper, better. <laughs> and, and one of the things that we learned in chap faster, cheaper, better is, well, pick two out of those three. Um, it's hard to do all three. Um, so while we all want to speed up the process, I think we have to be cautious that we, at the end of the day, produce systems that are, that are still state of the art and, and capable. You know, I, I remember when I was chief scientist, at least, oh gosh, at least once a month, someone would wander in my office and say, you know what we need to do? We need to start building P-51s again, because they'll be really cheap and we can build a, a lot of them. And Dave, I think you were the one who said if we did that, they'd be falling out of the sky like raindrops. Yeah, so, and we, there we are had, still people are advocating that we build P-51s. But, <laughs> I know, again, but, so we need to avoid that. And you know, you're right, the, the Century Series, as an example, had its pros and its cons. It, it, it was a time of innovation, rapid development, and most of them failed. So, so there's a balance there. Um, we've got a, I've got a number, of, we've seen a number of programs, a, a number of activities that I'm involved in where we have folks who are you know, pushing to do things faster, pushing to do things more quickly, and we think that's great. But at the same time, it's really important that you not cut corners. Um, I've been on, past few years, I've been on a couple of uh, failure review boards for aerospace systems. And the theme that we've seen in these recent failures has been a push to do things so rapidly that corners were cut. You know, you, 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 lo you lose the multi-billion dollar program because someone decided to save a million bucks on a, on a test that would have proven it, proven it one way or the other. And, and, and so we're, we're kind of trying to walk the middle line there. Um, you know, in the digital engineering, I will say most of the companies that, that I talk to are already essentially initiating that. I mean, our, our primes have, have fully incorporated computer modeling, modeling and simulation. Um, recently, I've, 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 well, actually, before, the, before this COVID-19 made us all hermits, um, I, I did a couple of visits to companies where, where they're showing me off their, their latest digital tools. And, and it truly has changed the way they design, but, but also the way they manufacture and, 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 and assemble their systems. So I, I think that part is already being incorporated. Well, you mentioned that uh, two decades seem to have become the norm in getting major, major weapon systems fielded. Um, and attempts to reverse this uh, have included efforts as diverse as acquisition regulatory reform to shifting integration uh, paradigms to more open systems. Right. I have two related questions for you. First, um, what role do you think testing has in extending these fielding timelines? Um, that is, we seem to test and test and test and test. Are we trying too hard to reduce risk to zero? And second, what role does risk aversion play in the timeline in today's R&D as well as a program of record development and fielding? So, you know, I, I think with testing, we, we need to take a balanced approach. You're exactly right. You, you can test something into oblivion and you never you and, and and you never wind up fueling it. You never wind up using it. At the same time, there are clearly some tests that you you want to do that you have to do before you fill the system. Um, in in my previous in the previous job that I had, we were, I was supporting the the White House, the Office of Science Technology Policy. And one day I had a question about ground test facilities. Um, the the director of OSTP basically asked me the question: Do we still need all these ground test facilities? I mean, are are wind tunnels obsolete was, 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 was basically his question. And I said, well, look, I, said, I could build an airplane and fly it without ever putting it in a wind tunnel. That would be a really stupid thing to do. I could do it. I'd be taking a lot of risk, just as I could drive my car around town without auto insurance. That would be a really stupid thing to do, but I could do it. So it, it really is a balance of risk and how much risk you're, you're willing to assume. And I, 
again, I'd advocate a middle of the road. You know, there's some testing that's clearly important. There's some testing that just becomes absolutely excessive. In terms of risk, I, I tend to divide risk into two categories. I think of risk in terms of noble risk and dumb risk. Noble risk is when, when you, you know what the challenges are, you know what the issues are, you know that something might not work, but you put it in the air or you put it in space or you put it in whatever and, and, and you see how it performs and you learn from that. Dumb risk is when you maximize the likelihood of failure by making bad choices in the way you implement your system, right? And I can give you example after example of systems that were that were tested in a way that the maximum risk had little to do with the technology that was actually being tested. And, and, and so we're, we're, we're trying to tip the balance. We're telling people, take risk. Risk is important. You need to be able to fail. But for crying out loud, let's, let's not maximize the opportunities for failure by the decisions that we make. Yeah, that's, a, that's it's a, an interesting and important subject. Um, there's also the sidebar with respect to uh, designing tests to such an exquisite degree with the objective of not allowing failure because of the concern with budget cutoffs um, if, in fact, uh, a failure occurs. You mentioned the Russians and the, and, the, and the old Soviet Union who would test and fail and test and fail and test and fail, and that's how they learned to move forward. But, okay, yeah. enough on that topic. Yeah. Mark, there's been a lot of buzz in the media about the promise of quantum computing. Yeah. Um, could you tell us how mature quantum computing really is and some of the major technological challenges that still need to be uh, overcome? And, and, and what, in fact, are the practical military applications possible uh, in the near term, or is this still way out there in the future? So the simple answer is quantum computing is way, way out there in the future. Now, one of our modernization priorities is quantum, but not just quantum computing. It's quantum science, using quantum principles across the board. We divide them in generally three different areas. One is uh, sensing, the other is computing, the other is uh, uh, quantum decryption. All right, so let me, let me talk about uh, the, the second two. So quantum computing, as, as I'm sure our, uh, all of our listeners know, Quantum computers have been held out as having this incredible promise for revolutionizing the way we do computation. Quantum computing depends on the use of quantum physics. Um, the fundamental unit of a quantum computer is something called a qubit, which is very different than a tradition, the way the, a traditional computer works. A traditional computer has bits, which can either be one or zero. All of our computing infrastructure is built on that. A quantum computer is built out of qubits, which can be either one or zero or a superposition of both those things. And the result is that with a quantum computer, you can have much, much higher computational speeds, higher information density, all these great things. Here's the problem. Right now, our best quantum computer is a Google machine. It's got 50 of these qubits because it's a quantum. It's based on quantum physics. Qubits are very difficult to manufacture physically. They have to be cooled to incredibly low temperatures. So our best machine now is sitting at 53 qubits. We think the first practical quantum computers are going to require something on the order of about 100,000 qubits. And to do real computation, you're talking about numbers in the millions, probably tens of millions. So 53 versus tens of millions. We're not there yet. We think it's an important area. Got we need it. to be investing. It's not going to change the way that we do things tomorrow. Um, quantum, quantum key decryption, another area that, we, that I get asked about often. And that's one where, yeah, you can use quantum principles to, to produce very difficult to break codes. The problem is it doesn't change the other vulnerabilities. So, so we, don't, we see that as an area to, to monitor, to look at, but not a, an area for major investment. But here's the one we are really interested in. Using quantum systems to provide first position navigation and timing, alternate GPS, and also quantum sensors. That's where we think is the big payoff. And the DoD laboratories have done a, a, an amazing job in advancing the state of the art. You know, a, a, a question that I used to ask the last time I was in the building and I still ask is, how are we going to operate, not if, but when we lose our access to GPS? And quantum seems to be one of the key ways that we can do that. So I've got a, an assistant director in that area. His name is Paul Lapata, brilliant, brilliant researcher on loan to us in the National Security Agency. And Paul is leading our efforts, but his primary focus is on PNT and on sensing. Awesome. I think that uh, your answer really uh, shed some light on a uh, on an area that is extraordinarily uh, complex. 
Yeah. Um, your portfolio also includes biotechnology development. Uh, can you speak to some of the biotechnology initiatives that might provide uh, new capabilities to uh, our U.S. warfighters? Absolutely. So, you know, the, the bio portfolio is an interesting one. I, I told you that when we first started that each of our areas has its unique opportunities and challenges. Our problem with bio up until about two months ago was that every time we tell people in the building, you know, this is a really important area to invest in, they'd say, <laughs> yeah, 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 but we've got other priorities. No yeah. one's saying that now. Right. So, so bio, in our mind, encompasses several things. First, it's, it's the obvious protection against biological attack and developing the methodologies that we're seeing coming into play today in, in, in responding to COVID-19. There's a, an incredible story about investments that we made primarily through DARPA on, on rapid vaccine development and addressing these sorts of threats. So that's part of it. But there are other parts of biotechnology that we're also very interested in. That is using biosystems to manufacture or produce either materials or substances. Right. For example, there are microorganisms that can produce concrete-like materials. We've already done experiments where you can grow a runway by spraying these organisms into the runway. So imagine if someone craters your runway, if instead of running in with the asphalt truck and, and you just spray in the bacteria, you stand back and you, 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 you grow a new one. Those are the sorts of things we're looking at. The other, the other sorts of technologies are using biological systems to refine, to improve, to process materials. For example, uh, rare, rare, rare earths. There are, there are biological systems that will concentrate rare earths, right? So this can be used as a manufacturing process rather than the much more expensive and cumbersome processes that we use today. And by the way, it's a nice way to address the threats of other people cutting off our access to rare earth materials. Uh, excellent. I mean, as you're speaking, I'm reminded of, uh, of those of us who are, uh, are into uh, uh, growing corals in an aquarium uh, you start with a real, real tiny piece, and, and over time, uh, uh, they, uh, they multiply and grow. Now, Mark, if you had one more dollar to spend on next generation technologies, where would you spend it and why? You know, right now, my number one technology priority, remember I said it wasn't hypersonics anymore. My number one technology priority is actually microelectronics. We think microelectronics is key because we are at risk of losing uh, losing the lead, losing our access to state-of-the-art technology. And, and I'll explain that. So the department a number of years ago had made the investments in trusted foundries, the idea of having our own foundries for manufacturing microelectronics. We had complete knowledge, supposedly, of what was going on in that foundry, and anything that came out of that foundry was supposedly fully trustworthy. Turns out that model didn't work out very well for a variety of reasons, but primarily there isn't a really good business case for a, a trusted foundry. The Department of Defense is a very, very small fraction, it consumes a very small fraction of the electronics being produced. And so what we're really interested in investing in is technologies that allow us to operate in what's called zero trust. Basically develop a part in a foundry that may not be a trusted foundry, but I have absolute trust that that part has exactly what I expect it to has and performs in exactly the way I expect it to perform. And, and that, to me, is actually our, our, our most important investment right now, because it, 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 microelectronics is, is underlying of almost everything that we do. Well, Dr. Lewis, thanks for that fascinating rundown of uh, the possibilities of the future and what you're doing to get to that future. Um, the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and AFA wish you all the best in this era of ever increasing challenges and uh, technological uh, opportunities. Thanks, Thanks again. My pleasure. Okay, we're gonna switch gears now, Mark, and okay. open the session to the media and um, our other uh, representatives uh, who've been uh, listening in. So let's get started. Um, those of you out there with a computer, um, uh, please raise your hands so I know that you are uh, actually interested in uh, taking a question. And let's start with uh, Steve uh, Trimble um, from uh, Aviation Week. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Mark, for, for, for doing this. Um, uh, first, uh, you, you could settle a bet in the Aviation Week office by telling us what the aircraft model is over your left shoulder. Graham thinks <laughs> it's a rascal. <laughs> Wait a minute. You guys don't recognize it? That, you mean the, the, the one with the, the, it's labeled Orient Express? That's yeah, actually got... a 30 year old model of one of the NASP configurations, one of the lesser known NASP configurations. One of those single stage to orbit things that wasn't gonna work. It's the one in front of the Redstone rocket. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, right right. There. oh okay. 
wow, well, Graham was wrong. Good. <laughs> um, no, Graham so, is seldom wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So uh, seriously, though, um, you, you mentioned earlier this uh, hypersonic uh, 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 war room for the industrial yeah. banks. And yeah. what I'm trying to understand is, um, to the extent you can quantify what affordable means when we're talking about hypersonic, uh, is it feasible or um, advisable even to to think about in terms of the same price that we would pay for at scale subsonic stealthy cruise missiles, or is it, you know, uh, like a Pac three NSE or SM three? I mean, what where what's the price range that ideally the DoD would like to pay, um, considering that if you want hundreds or thousands of these, they they've got to be somewhere in the affordable range. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a um, number of weeks ago, the secretary asked me one of my favorite questions about hypersonics, which is, so why wouldn't we want to do this? You know, often I'm asked, well, why do we want this capability? And, and, and that's my favorite question. Why wouldn't we want to do this? Um, and, and one of the answers that I gave him is, well, we wouldn't want to do it if it's too expensive. And, and so affordability is, is, is one of the keys, as you say. I'll start out by saying, I, I think it's it's a poorly posed question to, to address, to ask about affordability per unit. I think it's, it, we have to think of it in terms of the affordability of the capability that we're providing, all right? By that, I mean, if, if I've got a hypersonic system that costs twice as much as its subsonic counterpart and is five times more effective, well, clearly that, that, that's, that's, a, that, that's an advantageous cost scenario. But in terms of, of, of you know, practical numbers, look, the simple answer is we don't know what these things cost yet. We've asked the primes to, 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 to uh, uh, consider costs as they're developing, and I think they are. But I think there are some technology choices that we can make that will lead us to more cost-effective systems. For example, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm especially enthusiastic about hypersonic weapons that come off of the wings of airplanes. I think that's one of the keys, and, and come out of bomb bays. I think those are some of the keys to delivering hypersonic uh, capabilities at scale and at moderate cost. One of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about scramjet powered systems, about air breathing systems, is I, I think that fundamentally they, they can be lower cost than their rocket boost alternatives. And by the way, uh, they package better, which means I can get more scramjet powered systems on my aircraft than I could if it were a rocket based system. Um, we have, look, at the end of the day, we have to be careful we're not building boutique weapons. If we build boutique weapons, we won't, we'll, we'll be very reluctant to use them. And that, that again, factors into our, 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 our plans for delivering hypersonics at scale, delivering the numbers, but in order to do that, making sure that the, 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 that, that the cost equation is, 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 uh, is certainly beneficial. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up, John Turpak. Yes, Dr. Lewis, thanks very much. Um, I've been talking uh, recently to Air Combat Command, Global Strike Command. They seem very bullish on the Arrow system. Uh, but when I ask about uh, air breathing systems, they seem decidedly cool about that. Um, even when I put, couched it in as in the terms of, well, you know, eventually, maybe five, ten years, they, they still kind of shrug their, their shoulders and say, yeah, we're, we're going with the arrow for now. Can you give us a rundown on, on how things like Hawk are progressing and, and whether there's any reason why uh, they might not be confident in uh, the availability of those systems within a decade or so? Sure, John. So I want to be, I want to, I want to emphasize to me, it isn't an either or. It isn't rocket boost or air breathing. We actually want both because those systems do different things and they have different capabilities and different functionalities. Um, as I mentioned, the reason I'm, I'm especially enthusiastic about the air breathing systems is they tend to package better. They're, they're, they're smaller. They're more likely to fit in a bomb bay. Um, they have some advantages for sensor integration that the rocket boost systems don't have. Um, I'd also even argue that at the tactical scale, air breathing systems are more mature than the rocket boost systems. And, and let me be really careful how I explain that. So at the larger scale, it's clear that the rocket boost systems are, 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 are mature. We, we, as you know, we've done some recent tests. We did a test last month, which proved out that capability. Um, but a tactical system, something that's small, that packages, that fits on a pylon, that fits in a bomb bay, that's somewhat more challenging, and we've had more success so far with the air breathing system, at least in prototype programs, than with rocket boost systems. All right, so why is it that we're not all moving to air breathing? Um, I think there are a variety of reasons, and candidly, I don't think it was all technical. 
Um, the advantage of going to the Arrow system was it was able to leverage some of the other advance, advances, some of the other accomplishments of other parts of the hypersonic portfolio, in particular, the larger rocket boost glide systems. So that led to the selection of, of, of the Arrow system. I think also, you know, I, I made some comments earlier about our lack of consistency of programs. So for a variety of reasons, after we flew a very, very successful air breathing system, the X-51, we basically made a decision to stop flying it and move on to other programs. And so we set ourselves back a bit. And, and that, that, I would argue, was not a technology decision. That was a programmatic decision. But so the result is that when it came time to pick a first tactical system, um, the one that was chosen was the Arrow system, for better or for worse. Okay, so there's no uh, no reason you can think of that uh, uh, would suggest that the air breathing is either not going to be available on time or has developed some uh, uh, ob uh, obstacle or or hurdle that uh, make it more dubious as to whether it'll be available in the next ten years or so. The only reason I can come up with is money. <laughs> so other than that, look, you know, we remember the the most. The most exciting thing about the fourth flight of X-51 was frankly how boring it was in the sense that it did everything it was supposed to do. And that was a decade, that was, that was, that was a, a vehicle designed almost 15 years ago. So no, no technology obstacles at all. And, and I will tell you, I, I mentioned our, our hypersonic acceleration plan and, and in r and &E at least, um, a major part of that acceleration plan is a significant investment in our hypersonic air breathing technology. Thank you. Okay, Aaron Mehta from uh, Defense News. Aaron? Yeah, hey, thanks guys. Appreciate you doing this. Um, Dr. Lewis, uh, follow up and then a separate question. Um, on the war room, the hypersonic industrial based study that you guys have been doing, just wondering if you're seeing any impacts on uh, the industrial base for that or other programs you're working on from the coronavirus supply chain issues that Ellen Lord and others have identified. Um, absolutely. More, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're monitoring it very carefully. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're concerned about the, 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 uh, our first tier uh, 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 um, in, industrial uh, providers, but we're also word of right down the supply chain. You know, if, if you look in hypersonics, for example, some of the most uh, critical elements are produced by, by relatively, small operations. And, and so we're very sensitive to that. We're including that as we look at the impacts of, of coronavirus on the industrial base. But it's not just hypersonics. Um, it, it's really across the board. Um, uh, Secretary Lord has also initiated uh, an overall review across the, the broader industrial base, where we're looking at, 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 at uh, coronavirus impacts. And, and frankly, looking at ways that the Department of Defense can jump in and, and, and help help some of our industrial partners to, 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 to weather this storm. Well, appreciate that. Um, and then uh, on a somewhat separate issue, uh, since you deal with 5G and deal with communications, uh, the FCC has approved a request <laughs> for auto for a light squared, uh, which is something that DOD for years now has said would impact GPS capabilities. Uh, the FCC approved it on Monday, five to nothing. Uh, today, General Goldfein said that they're looking at mitigation measures to deal with that at DOD. I was wondering if you have any information about what those mitigation measures may be or what this decision might mean for some of the programs you're working on going forward. So, you know, the, the, the simple answer is I haven't talked to the chief about this yet. Um, it's obviously a concern. Um, our ability to operate not only in space, but in spectrum is, is critical. And so I, I guess... I guess what I would tell you is right, right now we're considering what the implications will be and considering what the impacts will be. And I mentioned that I've got an assistant director, actually a technical director who's overseeing our, our 5G efforts. His name is Joe Evans, uh, abs absolutely brilliant, brilliant uh, mind in this area. And um, this is, this is uh, part of his portfolio that we're, we're working pretty actively. Hey, thanks, Aaron. Thanks. How about uh, Teresa Hitchens uh, from uh, Breaking Defense? Hi, do you mean me, Sydney Friedberg? Yes, you do. Hi. Well, um, I, Sydney, I don't see your name up here. I see Teresa's, but breaking defense will work. Yeah. So, <laughs> she, you know. she is cuter than me, but, but, but by far, and much smarter on space stuff. But uh, <laughs> she, had, uh, she had a conflict because GeoIn is happening. Uh, 
uh, so you get um, an, ar an, ar an army guy, which means I'm going to ask you a question about the whole portfolio. I, you know, you got, you mentioned you know, we need different capabilities in hypersonics uh, for for different things. So you know, you mentioned the value of the air breathers, uh, the air launch air breathers. We also have a lot of work on, as you said, the, the ground and submarine launched uh, rocket boosted weapons that are more, I guess, the operational scale. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, presumably there's possibility for, you know, air launched boost glide and ground launched air breathers at some point. Um, so sort of a two by two, four box diagram. So what's sort of the, the, the military value of each of those things? What are the technical challenges for each of those things? Because uh, they're all very different spins on this core concept of high Right. So I, I want to start by saying I, I love that question because it, it gets to a point that I wish I had made, made earlier, which is that hypersonics isn't a single thing. And, and often it gets confused as a single thing. Uh, there are some folks who, who conflate hypersonics with a particular weapon or a particular application. It's a range of applications. It's a range of attributes. It's, it's based on the combination of speed and maneuverability and the trajectory at which you operate. So we're, we're really very enthusiastic about hypersonic systems that are attached to air, ground, sea systems. Um, they all have roles. They, they, they can all uh, 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 factor into our, our future, future strategy. Um, so as, as an army guy uh, or ex-army guy, is, is there such a thing as an ex-army guy? Once an army guy, always an army guy? Um, as an army guy, I'll tell you, I think that you know, the, the ground launch systems have some very, very interesting attributes and some very interesting applications. Um, uh, especially in, 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 uh, in uh, 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 interesting parts around the world. Um, and, and the beauty is that they can build on some of the technologies that we're uh, experimenting with and demonstrating in other domains. So one of the greatest stories that I think has come out that, that should come out on what we're doing in hypersonics is the connectivity between the Army and the Navy. So the, our lead for hypersonics for the Army is uh, General Neil Thurgood. Um, he works with Admiral Wolf on the Navy side. Those two are joined at the hip in their activities. They're sharing technology. They're sharing sharing developments. Um, I don't think in the last six months I've been to a single meeting with General Thurgood where General Wolf wasn't present and, and, and vice versa. And so leveraging those technologies in for those those different platforms, I think is 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 one of our great accomplishments. Um, so so. Um, now, you know, you asked about boost glide uh, and, and the air breathing for ground systems. The answer is, yeah, we're, we're interested in, in, in basically the full range. We're, we, we've got some ideas of things we want to deploy quickly, but we also are extremely open-minded about future applications, future technologies. Um, obviously, there's a larger investment now in the rocket boost systems. That's not only for the conventional prompt strike type systems, but as was mentioned earlier, for the arrow systems. But you know, eventually you could see some some uh, uh, ground launched uh, air breathers as well, and 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 I personally think those are very promising technologies. Uh, let me follow up. I realize I talk with my hands a lot, but I don't know if you can even see me. Uh, but uh, you know, what are the technical? Uh, you made very clear the technical advantage of the air breather for the airborne platform. It doesn't have to carry its own oxygen. There's this whole atmosphere we have full of oxygen. It can right. use. So therefore, if you can overcome, you know, the, the speed of the airflow and this problem, which, you know, snuffs out jets, but I guess not scram jets, and the heating problem with the friction, you can make a much more compact weapon that's much more air portable. Uh, you know, what are conversely the advantages of, you know, the boost glide approach? Uh, and, you know, what can you do with a, with a surface platform or a, sub, a submarine you can't do with an air, aircraft? and vice versa. You know, what's right. the unique value add in each of those technologies and each of those uh, domains uh, for launch? Sure, great question. So I think you actually uh, very effectively described the advantage of the air breather, which is that an air breather is swallowing its oxygen as it goes, which means it doesn't have to carry the oxygen on board. So you save in the oxygen, you save in the weight of the fuel, you save on the structure and the tanks that carries all that. That's all good. Air breathers have a few disadvantages. One is there's the cost of the engine. The engine can be a fairly complex piece of equipment, but also it limits some of the operations, all right? An air breathing system obviously has to operate the part of the atmosphere where it has enough airflow coming into the front of the engine that you can have sustained combustion 
reasonable mass flowing through the engine to provide propulsion. Um, air breathers can also be somewhat more susceptible to attitude. If I've got an air breathing engine, I have to worry about the airflow going to the inlet. I pitch up, I yaw too much, and I can disrupt that airflow in some way and, and, and negatively impact the operation of the engine. Boost gliders don't have that, that problem. The catch to a boost glider is I'm investing all the energy up front. I'm firing a rocket engine, I'm getting up to really high speed, higher speed than for the air breathers, and then I'm, I'm essentially gliding back in, losing energy as I go. That means that, that, that the boost gliders um, are in a much more um, energetic environment. So there the real challenge is uh, survivability. High temperature materials, for example, for leading edges that can survive in the much higher Mach numbers that you experience on a boost glider compared to the air breather. Um, in general, we think boost gliders will give you a little bit more range. Um, air breathers give you, uh, and boost gliders can give you more maneuverability, but air breathers, because you're releasing the energy constantly, maybe give you some advantages in, in, uh, in, in uh, maneuvering from point to point, redirecting your, your trajectory, for example. Um, biggest challenge for, for ground launching both of those systems is the size of the booster. If I'm launching from an airborne platform, obviously I already have energy, I already have altitude, it takes a smaller booster. Something that a launch off of a truck, launch off of a ship, requires a larger booster. Larger booster means uh, uh, more cost, more expensive system. It also has some logistics challenges. So all of those get traded off. And, and I said, I, I'll tell you, I don't think we know what the perfect answer is yet for the ground-based systems uh, or the sea launch systems. Um, but I would be surprised if, just as with the air, air, air launch systems, if the perfect answer isn't in fact that we need a combination of all of the above. Understood. You mentioned you know, the, the much higher Mach numbers on uh, the rockets, basically, as opposed to the air breathers. And obviously, you know, space is a place where you can, there's not friction once you get up there. Right. Um, I mean, what's the order of magnitude? Are we talking about, you know, air breathers are in the Mach 5 to 10 range and, you know, and things that, you know, boost glide through the, through the uh, you know, upper atmosphere in the, you know, 25 Mach range, like a ballistic missile? I just want to get it. Obviously, you can't give me the exact speed because we a don't know them yet. Yeah. They'll be classified, but or rough rough order of magnitude. So you already know, um, you know, X X fifty one for example flew at Mach five. So the scramjets tend to be Mach five, six, seven systems. We don't know if scramjets can go much beyond that. Boost gliders, in order to do a tactical mission, you're talking, you know, uh, at least twice twice that Mach number, albeit at a higher altitude. So it's not it's not it's 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 a slightly easier thing to do when you're at higher altitude. Um, but um, you're probably below, Mach 25 corresponds to orbital speed. For most of our boost glide systems, we're, we're not quite getting to orbital speed, but, but that kind of bounds it. Um, here's another way I like to think about it, by the way, in terms of energy. So I'll come back to, for the air breather, you're releasing your energy gradually as you go. For the boost glide, you're investing all the energy up front, and then you're bleeding it off. And, and those are really the, the, the fundamental differences between those two systems. Okay, well, uh, thanks again, Mark. And uh, to our audience, we've uh, come to the end of our uh, hour. Um, so we'll terminate it here, but I'm sure that uh, Mark would be happy to enter your, entertain your questions uh, uh, over time. But uh, thanks again for a very, very insightful uh, hours worth of information, uh, Mark. And uh, again, uh, wish you all the best in your endeavors. You're the, the best person for the job today. Hey, thank, thanks for the opportunity. And thanks for all that you do at the Michelin Institute. I mean, so much of what you've done has been incredibly influential in forming this portfolio. So keep up the great work. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Have a all great right. aerospace power kind of day. Thanks a lot.